you know, maybe there's going to be some nation states that are going to say, well, we don't want to use this BRICS currency, right? Like we, we don't want you guys having the world reserve currency. So maybe we're going to move to Bitcoin. So there's a lot of game theory at play there where one major currency blowing up is, is probably a massive step towards getting more people to pay attention to Bitcoin and getting, um, using Bitcoin. And so I've always said to friends and family, like the euro is going to be gone by the end of the decade. There, there won't be a euro, at least not in its current form, maybe a digital one, but like it could just be gone completely because it's already lost, I think, 40, 45 percent of its value in the 20 years that it's that's been around. Bing bong. I am back with another edition of the State of Bitcoin podcast where I've got a very special guest, John of Zapright, who just brought on Parker Lewis and Will Cole. And so, you know, we, we kind of I kind of talked about it with them uh, a couple weeks ago when I was back at Pleb Lab for Startup Day uh, about the overall disruption of the Bitcoin network when it comes to the payment system, creators, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, obviously Parker's known for the gradually then suddenly with Bitcoin adoption. So I'll start it right off the bat with you, John. Where do you think we're at with Bitcoin adoption? All right. Well, uh, yeah, Brandon, thanks uh, so much for having me on. It's uh, it's awesome to be on the show. I watched that uh, episode when you had uh, Parker and Will on. I think that was after the uh, startup day, right? When uh, they came in and, and kind of had a little chat. So that was uh, that was really great. Um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin adoption, like where do we start on that? It's we're at this point where, you know, I think we We've known Bitcoin has been a store of value for quite some time. Everybody knows that it's, you know, it's number go up. It's what brings people in, um, you know, to Bitcoin at the start, at least most people. Um, but I think personally, um, you know, I've had this view for quite a while that we actually need to get people using it and spending it. I know that some people will say that, like, you know, holding Bitcoin is using is using Bitcoin. Um, I agree. It is. It's just not using it fully, completely. It's one use case for it. The other use case is obviously spending. Um, and I think that will just get more and more important as time goes on, especially, you know, what we've seen with the, the you know, the bank failures and, and choke points and stuff that have, that have happened recently and will continue to happen. Um, and so I think the, the state of Bitcoin is a medium of exchange. And, you know, that's what we're here to do. It's upright. Yeah, for sure. And you guys are definitely pushing that forward. So, you know, as far as like, I guess, the use case of, you know, people kind of spending it. Um, you know, obviously you guys are making it a lot easier with, with ZapRite. Um, but where do you think, I guess, like the, you know, the gap that you're, you're filling with ZapRite, um, and like, where do you think, I guess the next step is for people to kind of get a little bit more comfortable because it seems like, you know, I guess there, there's a big hodl mentality, at least here in the, the United States where everybody's not, you know, kind of using it as a store for value, maybe a savings account, that kind of thing. But obviously, like you said, the next step is, you know, more of a medium exchange. So where do you think, I guess, uh, we're kind of, I guess, lacking, whether it's uh, maybe just a mindset shift, some sort of technology, like where do you think, uh, I guess, we can kind of help to, to fix and uh, move a step forward in the Bitcoin uh, adoption curve? Yeah, yeah, big question. Lots of answers to that. Um, I think uh, one of the it's need to we need to have that shift in mindset from from Bitcoiners who are uh, holding right now using it as savings. Um, the, we need to start to get more of those people to actually start spending Bitcoin, whether it's spend and replace um, or just spending what you've you've saved up in the past. Um, so mindset is definitely a huge part of it. Uh, the other part of it as well, we need to get more uh, merchants on board, excuse me, um, because that's going to be a huge driver of it, right? Because even if we have Bitcoiners who want to spend their Bitcoin, that can't happen unless we've got merchants who, who are willing to accept it. And so it really starts with merchants being wanting to accept Bitcoin. And of course, that's obviously where, where Zapright started and what we're all about is trying to solve that um, payment inflow part of it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess another part of it is the technology side of it as well. And we can expand on on, on any of these points, um, but kind of briefly just to explain where Zapright fits in on that is we, you know, you can be self-sovereign and run tools like BTC Pay Server, which are, you know, it's an amazing tool. And, you know, I wish every, it's, it's just a little bit more technical debt for most people. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people are just going to rely on on something a little bit easier. And on the other end of the scale, then you've got, you know, open node, BitPay, things like that, which are, you know, custodial, KYC, stuff like that. Again, like, you know, good tools for the use cases. But obviously, I think there's a sweet spot in the middle where Zapri can fill that need, where we can actually have people 
be self-sovereign in terms that they can still control the money, can still control their keys, um, but they don't have to run the server. They don't have to run the infrastructure. And so if we can provide really easy software to people to just plug in XPubs, hook up LND nodes, whatever it might be, Core Lightning nodes, um, or even third-party custodial services like Strike, if they want to use something like Strike or, or Ibex to manage liquidity for them or Voltage, they can do that. Um, but at least they have those options. So if we can provide those tools on the on the technology side of it to make it much easier for people, then we solve that aspect. Um, and then just expanding on that a little bit, if we can solve, um, you know, the the accounting and reporting side of it as well, which is pretty huge, which is always uh, a barrier for for a lot of people to to accepting Bitcoin, is the fact that they have all these, uh, you know, separate calculations and separate accounting and stuff. So it's a multi-pronged approach, but I think uh, convincing merchants to accept Bitcoin, um, giving them the tools they need to make that as easy as possible, and then convincing Bitcoiners on the other side to actually start spending um, I think if we can start solving a lot of those, even if it's just one at a time, um, then, you know, we'll be on the right path. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I agree with you hundred percent. And it seems like, you know, you're, you're obviously coming here from, from Austin, right? I mean, I, I met Parker and Will in Austin, uh, you're hanging out in Pleb Lab and, you know, it seems like kind of, I guess the Bitcoin Mecca is what I like to call it, right? There's a lot of Bitcoiners there. You got Pleb Lab, Bitcoin Commons. Um, you know, Marty's obviously down there and there's a lot of, you know, Bitcoiners in general that are living in Austin or in the Austin area. So uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of merchants have exposure to Bitcoin or have at least like heard of it. But what has that conversation kind of been like when you've been trying to onboard merchants, tell them about ZapRite and the product and, you know, what you guys can can help with about, you know, accepting Bitcoin? um as like a, a medium of exchange have you you know i guess seen a, a little bit of a shift in in a positive direction as of late um to try to get more merchants or, or i guess to onboard more, more merchants and to uh accept bitcoin yeah definitely i think there's i think there's definitely a shift in uh, a more positive direction on that side for sure um i mean one of the things i spoke about uh recently um with with marty actually um, when you mentioned Marty is on, is uh, he tweeted about um, his healthcare provider in Austin who had started accepting Bitcoin, um, and we had we had had a conversation uh, with Veronica, and we we had explained you know the benefits of of using Zapright and and obviously some of the benefits of of uh, Bitcoin itself and and holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet and accepting it. She had already had help from you know uh, John some lo other local Bitcoiners here who had you know started orange pilling her on that front. And um, so she got it. She got that side of it, and she was just looking for the right tool to be able to manage those payments coming into her into her practice. And so we had a call with her, um, and it turns out that you know Zapright fitted her her needs uh, perfectly well, um, and so she already had that uh that mindset of why she wanted to accept bitcoin and so when she found the tool she just said all right this is perfect this is natural fit and so she kind of made the announcement and, and put a web page up about you know the importance of of accepting bitcoin um and so we're finding more and more people who are you know open to that idea of you know they want bitcoin on the balance sheet or at least they want to be able to accept it because um they see the benefits of it, not just, you know, not just avoiding credit card processing fees and all that type of stuff, but just the ability to directly accept payments from somebody who values Bitcoin as, you know, the best money. They want to hold that. They want to spend that. Um, and, you know, the the medical industry is is very much aligned with that. Like if you've got a medical professional who who has that same mindset of like, well, look, your medical decisions are, you, you know, very, very personal thing for you. We want to give you the best information you possibly can to make those decisions. But ultimately, those decisions are yours and you will choose what's best for you. Um, and, and Bitcoin, you know, follows that same, um, you know, that same path where you we really want to give people the opportunity to use the best possible money there is. And we know that is Bitcoin. And so when you have merchants that line up with that same ethos and that same philosophy, then it's very easy for them to, to realize that they need and want to accept Bitcoin. And so we just need to offer them the tools to, to do that. And we're finding more and more that, you know, as we build out features on ZapRite, we're just meeting all of those needs um, for those merchants. And it's a very easy uh, thing for them to be able to like just quickly sign up, play with the app, realize, yep, yeah, this is perfect. It does exactly what we need uh, and they're good to go very quickly. 
Well, yeah, that that's great. And I think, you know, that that's going to be kind of more the wave and it's going to be easier and easier of a sell for you guys as ZapRite grows and as Bitcoin develops like over these years. And especially, you know, maybe with the halving as the number go up next year, right, more people will probably be willing to, to accept Bitcoin as it gets more in the news. But I want to know the biggest worry of uh, merchants. Like, do, do you have one that, that like, kind of stands out? Because I can think of a couple off the top of my head, but I want to hear your answer first before I go on my little ramble. Well, I don't know if I have an answer as to the biggest one, but there are certainly ones that, that pop up all the time, which is, you know, the volatility one, it, it, it doesn't come up that often, surprisingly, because, you know, the people who, who want to accept Bitcoin, they... They're kind of they're familiar with Bitcoin already. You know, either someone has orange pilled them or they've read something or they kind of know what it is. Like the example I gave before, they know the power of Bitcoin and what it actually stands for. Um, and they also realize that, like, you know, not everybody is going to pay in Bitcoin from day one. So it's not as if they're shifting, you know, all of their 100 percent of their income into Bitcoin from day one. And so. They're happy to use tools like ZapRite, which gives them this like one overall unified checkout where they can charge in Bitcoin or fiat and give the, the payer the option. And so it starts off with one or two people paying and then obviously multiplies to more and more. And so over time, you know, the Bitcoin coming in onto their balance sheet will increase. But at the beginning, it, it's a smaller percentage of their users. And so they're OK to deal with that volatility because they're, you know, this is a small percentage of my income. So I can leave it sitting in Bitcoin and I can deal with that volatility. So that doesn't come up um, as often. Um, a lot of the, the questions and the, the, you know, sales questions that we get are, well, how does this fit in with my accountant? Can my accountant work with this? Like what can what happens on that side of things? Um, and and that's where we're just building tools to make that easier as well. Uh, I mean, right now we've got a, you know, a, a fully um uh, a fully populated csv file which just gives you everything you could possibly need for your accountant to be able to uh, work with those uh work with those figures and those incomes and, and see exactly you know where they came from who they came from what the cost basis was the dates everything all that kind of stuff um so we already have that which which you know at the moment it it solves the need for like the vast majority of zapright users they're like yeah look just the csv once it has all the details i can give that to my accountant we're good to go but over time obviously there's improvements we can make there like we can have direct connections into quickbooks into sage you know zero netsuite all these type of things which just makes it even easier we can tailor those csvs and those connections work with the apis to actually get that information directly in there so we can actually make people more comfortable with signing up for a service like zapright where there really isn't that much of a disruption at all uh, to their accounting flow. It's just, you're just using different um, forms of payment. Um, and so once we give them all the information to account for those, then, you know, that that solves that problem too. Um, so they're kind of two of the main ones that that come up more so on the yeah, and that's great, you know, because that was going to be my my number one worry was obviously the accounting aspect of it. But obviously, you guys got that solved. But the other worry I have is the taxation aspect of it. Do you get any questions about that for, you know, people like, you know, they, they kind of have that worry, whether it's capital gains or if I get paid in Bitcoin, like how is that going to affect, you know, taxes come come end of the year when the IRS and the tax man comes knocking on the door? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, we, we, we get some questions like that, but not a huge amount because I think most people, you know, especially if they're uh, pre-exposed to Bitcoin, they kind of understand the capital gains aspect of it. Um, so that's not uh, that's not really something that comes up too often. We do get questions about, um, you know, how you deal with it, maybe as a as a freelancer, like if you're accepting Bitcoin. The simple answer is there. You don't really have to do anything at all because you just report your taxes as normal. If you're sending out an invoice through ZapRite for, say, a thousand dollars and you're getting paid in Bitcoin at the end of the year, when you're doing your taxes, you just have to report that you got a thousand dollars worth of income and you pay your taxes on that. What that now means is if you got paid in Bitcoin, you now have a thousand dollars or you have a, a specific amount of Bitcoin that has a thousand dollar cost basis. Um, and then it becomes, you know, when you want to spend that in the future, then you have to calculate, okay, well, was there a gain on that? And, and what are the tax implications of that? That's a fairly straightforward thing that, you know, most people who have been, you know, buying Bitcoin are, are probably well aware of. Um, when it comes to the, the, the business side of it or the enterprise side where you're, you're dealing more with kind of balance sheets and treasury and stuff like that, 
it, it does get a little bit more complicated, but not massively so, particularly with some of the new rules that came in, where you can now mark up uh, up and down the the cost of that, uh, the value of that Bitcoin. Whereas previously, you could only uh, mark it down or you had to mark it down when the, when the price dropped, but you couldn't mark it back up. Um, so now, uh, you know, the recommendations that are coming through from the, the, the various candidacy boards and stuff is that, look, hey, this, this really should be more fluid. We should be able to mark it up when the, when the value of it goes up. So when you're doing your quarterly reports or whatever it is, you don't have to have a suppressed value of Bitcoin on your balance sheet that, you know, might scare shareholders or, or anybody else like looking at your business. Thing. And so um, obviously your your balance sheet starts to look more healthy the longer you're on a Bitcoin standard. Um, and I think that's really what's going to be appealing to a lot of businesses now is really to make that balance sheet decision to get more business on their more Bitcoin on their balance sheet so that their business starts to look he- more healthy over time. Yeah, and that, that's that's great too. But, um, you know, it seems like a lot of the, I guess, more lightning based solutions now, or at least maybe the more mainstream ones, uh, are kind of, I guess, like indirectly that, like fiat rails, essentially, right? I mean, like, you know, I, I think of like Stripe Cash App, they allow you to send money, you know, instantly over the lightning network. Um, but essentially, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, a fiat transaction, um, almost like the Ven- Venmo or something like that using or PayPal using the Lightning Network, which doesn't have the fees. What I think is interesting about ZapRite is you guys are kind of diving into to Bitcoin as a medium of an exchange. So do you think that that's going to be, I guess, a competitive advantage for you in the long term? Because you guys are just, you know, you, you see the writing on the wall, essentially, with fiat, where it's like, you know, at the end of the day, all fiat currencies fail. And you're kind of diving into the new hard money standards. So when it comes down to the nitty gritty and, uh, you know, people want to start accepting Bitcoin more often, you know, it seems like people will turn more to ZapRite opposed to maybe ones that had, I guess, the fiat kind of uh, infrastructure and then chose to go to Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. I think it'll it'll definitely play to our advantage in the future because that's, you know, that's the the application that we're building. We're building the software to help migrate businesses onto a Bitcoin standard. And so eventually, you know, that's where most businesses are going to go. Um, and certainly that's the mindset that, that we have when like everything that we build in ZapRite is, is geared towards uh, the Bitcoin side of things. How do we make it easier for people to accept Bitcoin and manage that Bitcoin um, within their businesses? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously going to be some fiat integrations in there with Strike, for example, uh, IBEX, dif- different uh, services that allow you to exchange between uh, USD, Euros, whatever it might be, and Bitcoin. Um, but I think over time, as more uh, services start to integrate Bitcoin, like we've seen it with with Cash App, um, as, as more and more of these services, like you, know, you mentioned Venmo and things like that, we'll see more of those uh, applications integrating uh, Lightning into it. And so now the payments become much more interoperable, right? And whether they decide to settle in in USD and kind of build somewhat of a walled garden around their lightning infrastructure, that remains to be seen. But over time, like it'll just become unstoppable where they'll just have to open it up because people will be paying each other, you know, um, lightning peer to peer. Whether it goes through these KYC apps or not, that's, you know, the the user's choice. But we really want to provide people the flexibility to be able to do it in a peer-to-peer manner if that's what they want to do in a self-custody manner. But at the same time, we're wallet agnostic, so we can really plug in any wallet and just allow people to to build these checkout flows, um, particularly from the business side of things, right? Because that's kind of really where we're focused is allowing businesses to, to accept Bitcoin. And so if we can, you know, build these very flexible checkouts that allow people to to connect many different plugins from many different providers from self-custody all the way through to custody, um, single sig, multi-sig, like lightning, everything, we then just give people the flexibility to to accept these payments in ways that um, benefits them the most and benefits their customers the most. And so over time, I think people will will tend to graduate towards uh, ZapRite for that reason, is that flexibility to, you know, in the interim, offer these Bitcoin payment options alongside the fiat options on, as I mentioned, this one unified checkout. But then over time, as they find more and more customers um, paying in Bitcoin and using the Lightning Rails, they can actually start to, you know, migrate more of their business onto a Bitcoin standard. And that's where somebody like ZapRite can shine because that's, you know, really the the focus of our attention is building out a lot more of these tools that, that make that uh, a reality for more businesses. 
Quick commercial break to bring you some of the dopest Bitcoin merch in the game. That's Hodler's Official. That's H O D L E R S official.com. You can go and get yourself a black jersey like I got on right here or a white one where you can get the Genesis pack with the 09 on the block, repping Satoshi, repping the number one guy in Bitcoin. And you can get yourself the best merch by going to hodlersofficial.com and using promo code Green Candle for 10% off your entire order. That's two handfuls of percentages, ladies and gentlemen. 10% off. You can use the rest of that to purchase more Bitcoin or do whatever you want with it. But I'm saving you some Skrilla Manila. So go ahead and get yourself one. I prefer the black, but if you like the white, I don't mind that either. All right, now back to the show. Yeah, that, that's great. But you mentioned like self custody and kind of like the wallet ag agnostic approach, which I think is awesome. Um, but I, I have a question, I guess, on along those lines, right? I mean, because it seems like, you know, a major corporation or a big business that you would able like say Walmart, for example, they get, you know, millions and millions of transactions a day. And, uh, you know, in probably that, that I don't know, probably multi-million dollar range uh, in a month or something like that, um, where as, you know, maybe like a, a freelancer, for example, gets paid once a week or once a month or, or something like that, uh, maybe maybe once a day from like various projects that they're doing and they have deliverables, and whatnot. But either way, it's a much smaller, I guess, dollar scale, Bitcoin scale than maybe like a big time merchant. So in my opinion, I think that a big, big uh, merchant would be a little bit more fearful when it comes to, to self custody, opposed to like maybe a freelancer who would really want something like that. Is that kind of a trend that you're noticing as well as like kind of the bigger the scale of the company, the more likely that they're, uh, I guess, wanting uh, more of like a custodial solution opposed to, you know, kind of really just taking that ownership and, you know, uh, going through self custody? Yeah, exactly. I think there's, you know, there's going to be a range of customers um, and users of ZapRite with with varying needs and, you know, comfort zones as to what it is they want to do. Um, in terms of the, the need side of it, there's, there's going to be different payment sizes, obviously, right? If you're a freelancer and you're taking in a couple of hundred bucks, you might be able to do that over Lightning. Maybe you want to spin up your own L&D and connect that for complete self-sovereignty, or maybe you're happy to use like Strike or Ibex or something like that and we'll derive addresses and that can go straight into your wallet as well. Um, so you've got everything from that side all the way up to maybe a large enterprise, as you mentioned, maybe they don't want to deal with the custody side of it because either one, they they just don't want to to have that responsibility or two, it's just, it's just larger amounts and they would rather have that uh, in a more secure location. And so that's why we, you know, integrate with folks like Unchained, right? Where they can businesses can go to Unchained and set up these uh, secure multi-sig vaults, and then they can connect those uh, directly to ZapRite. So now all of these payments can just go directly into the Unchained vault. So if you're a business, a large organization, and you know, let's say you're a, a, a multi-partner legal firm, and and you're taking in like hundreds of thousands of dollars per month or millions of dollars per month, you're probably not going to want them coming into like, you know, a self custody wallet on your desktop or your phone or something, right? You're going to want them going into the likes of Unchained where they can stay um, secured under a multi-sig. Um, and so we really have a range of those options to kind of suit every, some of the larger firms with the larger, more regular, larger payments on chain would uh, go more towards a custody option for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think obviously uh, the bigger the scale, the more companies on a Bitcoin standard, I think the less likely that they would, you know, have to, or, you know, the less likely they would want the, uh, I guess, full on like self custody kind of route. Maybe they would want to partner with something like Unchained. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, that's another rabbit hole that we could go down at another time, but I kind of want to go into a little bit about like, I guess, you know, being a startup in the overall kind of shaky hairy macro environment so obviously you know i i think i got exposed to zap right i want to say at startup day last year um so even before um i had maybe your colleague on um i believe on startup day in 2022 at some point in time um and so I, I've, I've heard of you guys i know i've seen the zap right flag in pleb lab for quite some time um but obviously it's been kind of like it's been a bear market in bitcoin um, and it's, you know, a very shaky global macro economic environment. Um, so what has that been like just being, you know, kind of a startup uh, in that environment? Have you noticed, you know, I guess 
more positive things like kind of ahead. Obviously, I mean, you guys are growing pretty well. Um, but, um, you know, obviously like, you know, maybe finding some funding that those kind of things, there's, there's various roadblocks with startups. So how has that experience been kind of, I guess, building in the bear market? Yeah, it's been, I mean, first answer is it's been amazing. I love it. I'm just like eternally optimistic. I just think it's, it's, it's a really great time to, to get some work done in a bear market. Um, but you know, to expand on that a little bit, yeah, we, you know, I moved, I moved down from Canada in, you know, 2021, late 2021, um, and was, was the first, you know, business, so to speak through the doors of Pleb Lab. It had just started at that time. So they set up the hackerspace in Austin and, and ZapRite was kind of the first, uh, one in there. So yeah, we still got the flag hanging on the wall. You've been, you've been here a couple of times. Um, and I think you did chat with Nate, um, who is, uh, you know, an advisor for us and, and has, uh, you know, worked with us like from the very start. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we raised a bit of money, um, in early 2022 and, you know, the bear market quickly hit in the middle of 2022. And so, you know, I kind of had a decision to make, like, do I, do I keep trying to raise money or do I kind of look at what I got and be grateful and, and start building? And that's what I did. I kind of said, all right, well, like, look, I have enough here to, to hire a developer and start, you know, doing some serious work. And so really we kind of just put our head down and, and between the two of us, between my kind of design background and this, this full stack senior engineer, like we were able to just get a lot done in the bear market. We completely rewrote the, the, um, the code base from the ground up, uh, and really started from scratch to get ourselves set up in, you know, for what we knew would be like, you know, we, we needed more, um, of a solid base to actually scale zap right and, and and move the application on to another level the code i had written at the start just wasn't gonna wasn't gonna cut it so um so yeah we really took the 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 opportunity to kind of just like you know get heads down and and build um and i knew that we were in for tough times like i i could see that from from last year uh and so i kind of just made the decision to be extremely frugal with the money um, not splash around the, the investment money that I got, but really try and, um, put that to the best use that I possibly could. And so we managed to, to, you know, stay alive and, and very healthy. We've got like plenty of runway left. We're not in, not in any danger at all. Um, which is amazing, but it's also kind of, you know, sad to see a lot of the, the companies that we've been surrounded by both here in, in Austin and other places having to, you know, scale back and lay off staff and do things like that. But also that's kind of an opportunity for us where we can like pick up some contractors and stuff and start to, to, to work, you know, a little bit faster as we, as we come to the kind of, you know, trough in this bear market and we start to like, you know, turn the corner, we can actually start to like pick up some of those staff and start to work a little bit quicker. And so that would be, that's what we've been able to do with the, with the money that we still have left over and the runway that we still have. So it's been an opportunity for us because of, you know, I, I, I was very, very careful with the money that I raised in, in 2022. It was just a small amount, a few hundred thousand dollars, um, you know, a lot of money, but a small amount in terms of, of raising money for a round. Um, but it meant a hell of a lot to me. And it was, it enabled just, uh, like I said, just really exciting time to be around a lot of these, uh, top quality developers. And a lot of these people that pass through Pleb Lab here in Austin, it's, it's a truly exciting place what car is doing here and has done and, and folks like Kyle and stuff before and McCarr and Keon are doing is, um, it's amazing. It's like, it's just really, really, truly an amazing experience to be here surrounded by a lot of these phenomenal, um, Bitcoiners and, and developers that are really kind of pushing the boundaries of what's possible. I mean, we're seeing a lot of that with super test net. Now, a lot of the stuff that, um, that he's doing is, is really getting a lot of people talking and that's great. Um, so to be surrounded by that every day is amazing. And as, as you know, Austin is, you know, one of, if, if probably not the center of, of Bitcoin in, uh, in the U S at least, I know there's some people who will, uh, argue that and, and throw around a few other cities, but, um, you know, no doubt there's, there's just amazing things happening here. So it's been great to be part of it. Um, the bear market, while, you know, we all want the price to be higher, we all want more users and more people kind of, you know, gravitating towards Bitcoin we just kind of have to be realistic that, you know, at least 
for the time being, Bitcoin seems to be moving in cycles and we have to respect that and we have to manage our budgets and our, uh, and our runways accordingly. Um, and so we've been able to do that. And, you know, we're in a really, really great position now, especially with Parker and Will coming on board to, to be able to take ZapRite to the next level. So super excited about, um, you know, everything that's happened in the last year, not just for ZapRite, but the, the amount of companies that I see um, folks working super hard out of, out of Pleb Lab here and Bitcoin Commons uh, every day. Um, you know, I, I'm super excited about what's going to happen in, in the next kind of 12 to 24 months. I think we're going to see an explosion of, of applications coming out that are just going to make uh, Bitcoin, you know, a hell of a lot more user friendly and, and more mainstream. And that that's great to see. But, you know, that's the old cliche bear markets are for building. So I've, I've certainly been witness to that. And it's been amazing. The energy in this podcast is brought to you by Sovereign, the number one energy drink in the game. You can use promo code Green Candle at SovereignEnergy.com. That's S-V-R-N dot com. And you can get 10% off your entire order whenever you put in promo code Green Candle. And on the side, they've got a pull tab. You can pull off this tab after for every single one. Scan it. they got a QR code in each can. And you get sats back too so woo, now go get yourself some sovereignenergy.com promo code green candle all right back to the show yeah i mean it seems like you did you know uh, obviously if you have like a lot of runway left you you were uh very uh i guess smart with with the uh the, the way you use your the money that that you were able to raise which is awesome um but you know it seems like a lot of I guess maybe not first time founders, but a lot of the, the Bitcoin kind of CEO founders that maybe raised uh, a little bit before or like in 2020 and then saw that run up, uh, got kind of, uh, I guess, I don't know if I want to say just like kind of threw their money around, like not necessarily, I'm not trying to, you know, I guess throw anybody under the bus or rip anybody, but it seems like they, they took a little bit more risk. They were a little bit more leveraged. We saw, uh, you know, a few companies, uh, very big companies fail because of that. Do you think it was kind of an advantage that, you know, you raised money in a time where it was kind of a little bit more of a dilapidated price? We had we had already hit the all time high and we've come down a little bit. And like, you know, you because you raised at the time that you did, you were able to stay like a little bit more level headed and just say, OK, you know, I, I understand Bitcoin goes through these waves. So I have to, you know, stay a little bit more flat and level headed. Uh, in order to avoid, you know, the volatility of not only being an entrepreneur, but the volatility of Bitcoin as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I think definitely it helped uh, for sure. I mean, I I could have looked at it as a negative. Um, you know, like I said, market hit and, you know, investors kind of scurried and everybody kind of got a bit worried. And I kind of, I, I could have looked at that and thought, you know, oh, damn, this is not going to work out. You know, I didn't get all the money I wanted. Like, you know, woe is me. Like, this is this is not great. But at the same time, to your point, I kind of looked at it and thought, okay, I have enough. I have enough to, to keep going and do a hell of a lot. I know I can manage this amount that I've got in. But also with the bear market hitting so fast, right? Everybody thought we were going to keep going to like, you know, two, 300. And we just kind of reversed very quickly and dropped. And so I guess that was a very, very, um, you know, very clear uh, wake up call that, OK, like this could last for a long time. Um, and so I better look after the money that I've got in. Whereas it could have been a very different story if I had to raise like six or nine months beforehand and I filled out the whole round and I thought, OK, great, I've got another like, you know, 18 months of bull run. So like, let's just continue to go and start splashing money around. So I think definitely having the bear market things are not going to be as rosy as, um, you know, some people might say, at least not um, for as long as they thought it would be. Um, and yeah, we saw we saw a bunch of companies, um, you know, lately having to having to like, as, as I mentioned, like lay off uh, some some folks and, you know, cut their teams down a little bit, which is, you know, it's always unfortunate to see that these are all great Bitcoin companies trying to build things. And so you never really want to see that happen. Um, but in the startup world, there is there. This is more from the VC side, but like you know, traditional Silicon Valley VCs, like the the mentality there really always is, you know, if you raise a first round or something, like you gotta literally just start expanding the team like crazy. 
make it look like you're going places like just increase your head count and just expand and make yourself look bigger right puff your chest out um and then re- then you can raise another round and you can go and i don't know if that's what a lot of bitcoiners like founders fell into that same trap as well i mean maybe they raised some money when the times were good and started like increasing their headcount too quickly we are in that position now where they they have to kind of peel back a little bit whereas we didn't take that approach um you know i could have i could have hired three developers and said like oh yeah this is perfect i can pay three developers for a year like let's go but i didn't because uh i just knew that you know times were going to get tough further on and so um yeah i mean i think definitely uh you know, I guess that's a long winded way of saying like, yes, raising money and having a bear market hit halfway through that is uh, it definitely kind of shakes you up and makes you realize a few things very quickly. Yeah, and that's a great point. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting because I guess from like that you brought up like Silicon Valley and like the kind of the tech boom and kind of how people were just almost like over like putting on a bunch of fat in order to, you know, essentially make themselves look like they're going places. And it seems like, you know, that's, a very, I guess, like risky kind of like boomer bust approach, which a lot of people outside of Bitcoin kind of take look at Bitcoin as like a, you know, a boom or a risky kind of investment or, you know, uh, uh, and it seems like a lot of, I guess, newer Bitcoin founders that I've seen are more like risk averse. Do you think that that's kind of, I guess, maybe along the lines of, I don't know, what do you kind of equate that to? Is it like the hard money principles? Is it you know, maybe they're like kind of have the same mindset as like gold bugs. And so they don't see Bitcoin as necessarily like a risky investment, even though the volatility goes every which way every day. Like, why do you kind of think that that is? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a Bitcoin or attitude of, you know, it is this whole low time preference thing, right? Um, you know, as you as you become a Bitcoiner and you go deeper down that rabbit hole, you do like because, the you know, the world seems to be falling apart every time we turn on the news there's some crazy stuff that's you know designed to make us like scared and you know hunker down in our homes and not do anything but the reality is like there's there's an amazing bright future ahead of us and we just have to strive towards that um and when you're a bitcoiner you realize that and so you start to make these life decisions um that that help you on that path so whether it's looking after your health or your your family and relationships and things like that your education you just want to become a better person for this bright future that you see happening you know it's going to be a longer longer um path ahead patient of you know trying to make things happen immediately and successes happen immediately you're more about like building the solid foundation for those successes to inevitably happen in the future and so i think as as bitcoiners when you're, you're when you're running a company when you become a founder of a bitcoin company you have to take that same mentality around your company as well you cannot look at it any differently you have to realize that we are building for a, a world that is not in place yet and we don't know when that's going to be in place we obviously want it to be sooner rather than later but we have to recognize that you know there's going to be a lot of disruption between now and then things are not going to move as fast as we we would like them to move even if they did, are we really ready? Do we have the applications? Do we have the software? Do we have the tools ready for people? You know, if all the banks start failing again and people are shut off from the banking system, do we really have the tools ready for them to be able to like accept payments and make payments? I would argue, no, not yet. This is why we need to, to build more applications, um, you know, consumer facing uh, applications on top of Bitcoin. Um, and obviously there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to happen on the protocol level. Um, but you really have to take that uh, mindset of you need to protect your Bitcoin business for the long run. You cannot, as you say, like put on a lot of fat and and pretend that you're doing well, hoping that things are going to work out. Um, you really just have to to you know take the same approach you do to your own life to be no. We need to kind of like take a step back, um, build the foundations for for a longer future, um, and and work from there. And, and your business is no different. You really have to take that same approach. Yeah, and I, I agree with that 100%. But I also, you know, you made a point about, uh, you know, are we ready for something of uh, like getting on a full Bitcoin standard? And you said you don't think we're there yet. I agree with you 100%. I think, you know, we're still some some years away. So I'm going to put you on a spot here. How long until you think we, we're going to be able to be ready to be on like a full Bitcoin standard? Because, you know, it seems like, I don't know, if you turn on the news, you you open up Twitter, uh, you go on somewhere like, you know, it seems like everything's doom and gloom these days, right? I mean, we have, 
you know, wars breaking out left and right, um, a bunch of other things kind of, uh, you know, collapsing, maybe even kind of like a monetary war that we got going on with Europe. Um, so, you know, how many years away do you think, like, what are some other like big giant things that we need to big giant steps that we need to take in order to get to the ability to, you know, potentially be on a Bitcoin standard? Oh man, that's, that's, that's a hard one to answer because, you know, it's, there's so many factors involved in that. Um, you know, if, I mean, you know, one, one major currency blowing up is, is probably a massive step towards getting more people to pay attention to Bitcoin and getting, um, using Bitcoin. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, you know, all of the macro events, like, you know, including current ones that are going on right now are contributing to that, right? It's just more money printing. It's more, you know, uh, it's just more washing of the washing of the printed money. So it doesn't look as bad as it does, but realistically, um, you know, it all has the same effect at the end of the day. So whether it's a longer drawn out thing or whether there's some bigger macro events that actually force it to happen quicker than, than we anticipated. Um, but again, of you know slowly moving in the wrong direction until all of a sudden they just blow up and that and that's that but again to answer the timeline of when that's going to happen like who knows um i've kind of you know i've always had this you know thing that i've that i've said to people and i don't know whether i'm kind of just saying it more out of like you know to plant the seed in their head or whether actually i think it's going to be true but you know i come from ireland so we've we've had the euro um introduced in i think it was like 2000 or 2001 or two or something like that but it's not very old 20 years maybe um and so i've always said to friends and family like the euro is going to be gone by the end of the decade there, there won't be a euro at least not in its current form maybe a digital one but like it could just be gone completely because it's already lost i think 40 45 percent of its value in the 20 years that it's that's been around um and so you know things like that are going to happen, whether they happen by the end of the decade or whether it's like a bit longer, like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll leave it at that because it's just, it's just too, too hard to, to answer. Uh, yeah. And it, it seems like, I guess that's kind of, uh, you know, almost the doom and gloom, so to speak. So, but how do you think, I guess we're going to get to a full Bitcoin standard? And I've asked this to a couple other people and I'll, I'll lay out, I guess, two scenarios that I kind of see as, as a potential one is, you know, we do the the gradually, then suddenly, and kind of, you know, for I guess not even better of a better expression, shit hits the fan. You need to have basically your, you know, your food locked up, maybe a, a, some weapons, some other things. Like it's, you know, World War Z out there, so to speak. Like it's kind of doom and gloom. We have, uh, you know, we hit rock bottom before we can rebuild. The other is, you know, maybe we uh, find some sort of in between currency where, you know. Um, the dollar fails or, you know, something like the uh, BRICS currency comes in or the dollar gets backed by some hard assets like Robert Kennedy, for example, has come in and tried to say that that's what he would like to do is back the dollar by something like Bitcoin, real estate, gold, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that lasts for maybe a couple decades, but then that inevitably fails because it still requires a trusted party. And, you know, as we've learned over you know, at least the past decade with the, you know, growth of social media, it seems is, you know, everybody's starting to wake up that we can't really trust the governments. Um, and then, um, and then we get to maybe a, a Bitcoin standard. So I guess out of those two scenarios, what do you think is, is more likely? Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, where's your kind of, I guess, mindset at when it comes to that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know which one is more likely. I mean, you know, if, if the US dollar was to to fail as the world's reserve currency and something else stepped in like a BRICS currency or something in its place, um you know, maybe that will just prolong the the fiat world a little bit longer, but I think the inevitable will still happen. Um you know, if you in in a scenario like that, you know, maybe there's going to be some nation states that are going to say, well, we don't want to use this BRICS currency, right? Like we, we don't want you guys having the world reserve currency. So maybe we're going to move to Bitcoin. Um, you know, so there's a lot of game theory at play there where, you know, even if another currency does come in, um, it could be, it could be a combination of Bitcoin and, and other things until eventually those other things fail. Um, I think obviously, you know, all roads lead to Bitcoin. Bitcoin will ultimately be the winner because there, there will only be one, 
money. It's certainly in an open and, and, and fair market. Um, if, if governments run out of money and their currencies fail and they can't print any more, um, you know, Bitcoin is, is going to be the, the stronger victor there that comes that comes to the forefront. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I think it's inevitable how it happens, you know, whether there is an intermediate currency, whether whether Bitcoin kind of just steps in there immediately and, and takes that role, um, you know, overnight. I don't know. It's tough, but I think we may start to see. I think we'll just we'll start to see Bitcoin, you know, kind of slide into more and more aspects of the macro economy over time, whether it's, you know, nations, you know, um, trading commodities uh, for Bitcoin or, you know, whether it's some nations adopting Bitcoin like El Salvador or other nations, maybe, you know, creating their own currency, but being back to Bitcoin, like th there's probably going to be a combination of a few things that are at least attempted. Um whether whether they last, how long they last, and what effect they have is you know is is unknown. But again, I'm I'm just like you know ultimately confident that that all roads lead to Bitcoin, and so I'm not really worried about kind of what happens in the meantime. Um, I'm just setting up for the inevitable future of uh, of a Bitcoin world. Whether it happens in my lifetime, I don't know. But um, as long as I'm fighting for the right cause and I'm heading in the right direction, then I'm happy. I can sleep well at night. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I've been putting you kind of on the spot here. So I appreciate you rolling with the rolling with the questions. But um, let's go into a little bit of a brighter note, right? We're here, we're filming it October 13th. Um, so, you know, there's about three months or so left in, in the year. Um, and then, you know, obviously, we got 2024, uh, the halving coming up, like, what are some big things that got you excited about Zaprite and uh, Bitcoin in general that we we've got kind of coming up on the docket? Anything that you know really stands out to you? Um, well, I mean, in terms of time in the in the in the bear market, just building and refactoring the code base and and getting everything um, you know ready to be able to to be able to scale on a more solid footing. Um, we launched that in April, and then we spent some time um, you know kind of tidying up a few things and building in a couple of extra features, which we announced at, at Bitblock Boom at the end of. Um, at the end of August, which was like our payment links, which are like a, you know, a great compliment to the, the invoicing that we already had in there. Um, and so now I feel with Zap, right, with, with the, with the solid base that we have from our rewrite and our bear market building, and also bringing on obviously folks like Parker and Will joining is just going to be an, an amazing accelerator for, for Zap, right? And now, as I mentioned before as well, we're in a position where we have a bit of runway and we can actually take on a few contractors and actually start to, to build more features. I just, I'm incredibly excited about where we are as a company. And I think we can just start to crank out, um, you know, some amazing new tools over the next, uh, you know, six to 12 months. And that will take us obviously into, as you mentioned, the halving next year. And then, you know, who knows what's going to happen then? Like, are we going to be, you know, you know, where do we, where do we turn? Like, who knows? Um, like I said, I'm just incredibly excited for, for everything that's happening. And regardless of, of what happens in, in the Bitcoin market and the price, um, you know, I don't want to say price is irrelevant because, you know, it plays a big role in terms of, you know, just general overall um, exposure and people's, um, you know, willingness to be, to be open to be, you know, talking about Bitcoin and experimenting with Bitcoin. It, it plays a part, but ultimately at the end of the day, we all know it, it, it's going to swing up and down, left and right. Well, not left, but like maybe flat for uh, for a while. But uh, realistically, it's just like my super bullishness on everything that's that's happening um, in in the space in terms of like people building and stuff. It's just it's incredibly exciting to see. I think um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of applications, I think, and and services and, and tools that will come to the market over the next six to 12 months as we kind of ramp up towards uh, and after the halving. And I think that's what I'm really incredibly excited to see. But just in terms of everything else, like I said, I know there's a ton of people working on amazing stuff and I'm going to be incredibly uh, excited and bullish to see all that stuff come to market over the next few months. Yeah, that's great stuff. And John, you've been very generous with your time. So I'm glad we could sit here and talk a, a bunch about the Bitcoin space and ZapRite and what you got going on. So um, why don't you tell the people where they can find you and uh, what all like, I guess, where they can follow along with ZapRite and and yeah, maybe even contact you if they if they're interested in the product. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks uh, so much for having me on. Um, I've been excited to come on. Um, I watched, uh, you know, living in Ireland um, for the last while. I haven't been here in Austin. So uh, watching your live streams and, and interviews and stuff around the startup day and everything, it's, uh, it's an incredible service that you've, uh, that you've done. So I want to thank you personally for that. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, where people can find me, um, you know, zapright.com is obviously the website and app.zapright.com to sign up for the app itself and, and you know, start a free trial and, and play around, use the features, give us some feedback on Twitter. And uh, personally, I'm John underscore Zapright on Twitter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you if you want to check Zapright out, just uh, like I said, you just need an email address um, to sign up. That's it. And if you got any questions or want any onboarding help, just like hit us up. One of us on the team will be more than happy to to um, talk through any questions you have or, or give you an onboarding demo. So, yeah, appreciative of your time. Thank you so much. Of course, man. Of course. Yeah. Keep up the great work. And I'm definitely following along Zapright and I'm rooting for you guys. So let me know if there's anything else I can do for you guys. And uh, yeah, everybody else, go check out Zapright. At least like give them a follow on Twitter if you're not going to get gonna sign up for the service or anything like that. But if you're a creator, this is something that you should definitely uh, check out. So yeah, John, thanks so much, man. If you enjoyed this interview, you're going to love my recent interview with Parker Lewis. You can find that right here. You can go ahead and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and that bell notification so you get notified whenever I drop new videos. All right. Thanks so much. Catch you at the next one.